You're listening to Discography Discussion, episode 214, Maylene and the Sons of Disaster. Hosted by Dan Terry. Get down, y'all. John Beatty. I mean, it's kind of a you thing. (laughs) And Joseph Wren. That would have been a really good idea. (laughs) Presented by DiscussMetal.com. And if you released four self-titled albums... Then you are ready for this episode of Discography Discussion. I am Joe. That is Dan. That is John. I don't think it makes you any different than like Led Zeppelin or Boston. Or on Earth. Or on Earth. Well, on Earth had titles of their albums. Well, they also had like three. Watch it, Joe. I mean, if Led Zeppelin is ready for this episode, then I support that discography discussion. When is that happening? Never. I don't know. You can't just ask me a question like that, Joe. You're on the show. Come on. (laughs) Well, now is not the time for one of the most influential hard rock bands of all time who happen to use recorders in some of their songs. This is the time for some serious rock with some serious groove and everything Southern rock going on at the same time. A little bit of bluegrass snuck in there and uh, some hardcore for the Dan Terry's in the house. Yeah, I mean, there's a little bit of hardcore. Uh, They mixed my hardcore uh, with a little bit of, uh, you know, a little bit too much Pantera groove, but, you know, (laughs) I I, I guess I can handle it. Uh, I will say this. I don't think anything that these guys played was even anywhere on the same level as Pantera, but uh, I I will say that. But uh, I could definitely see what they were going for. Uh, Maylene's an interesting band to talk about because, you know, everybody remembers back in like, you know, way back in my day, which was about 15 years ago, 16 years ago now, uh, every band that was in the metalcore scene, not every band, but a lot of the bands decided, you know what, metalcore is getting kind of old. Let's uh, let's all go Southern metal. So, I mean, he's legend did it. Maylene did it. Well, Maylene didn't do it. They kind of were always that way. Uh, and uh, the showdown uh, famously did a did a more southern uh, type of record. Um, Hell yes! I feel like I feel like on these early um, southern metalcore records, everybody's channeling uh, "Every Time I Die" a little too hard, um, but not really. It's weird because I don't consider "Every Time I Die" to really have this sound, but I feel like a lot of bands heard it. And they're like, "How do we how do we take this a little south of the Mason Dixon line?" Um, and th- that's that's how you end up with a band like Maylene, which is which is the epitome of the, of that type of style. They're the band everybody looks at and says, "Look, look, they're doing it, they're doing it." And every a lot of the other more established bands that did this style at the time were like they 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 did it for a season and then they moved on. Uh, Maylene, their whole thing was this, and uh, they owned it pretty much to the end. There's almost a batshit insanity that goes into this style at the time it was released. It was quite literally the exact opposite of everything that was popular. The little bits that you would compare to a Pantera were just where the music originated from. It wasn't necessarily what was popular or even the direction of heavy music at the time. But because it was so different, everybody stopped and paid attention which is how you innovate and how you set the standard for what's going to happen tomorrow. Almost an American standard, as it were. <laughs> well, I'm sure Brandon will, pe- will appreciate that shameless plug. That'll be $5. Send it to Dan and Joe Show <laughs> at gmail.com. Thank you very much. Well, you made some light work out of that one, Joe. Absolutely. But before John Beatty decides who's more tough, him or John Jacobs, I'm going to take this time to say thank you to everyone for listening to the podcast. Thank you for listening and for subscribing. If you are not a subscriber, then you can find everything discography discussion at discussmetal.com. We are on Spotify, Apple and Google Podcasts, TuneIn Radio, Stitcher, iHeartRadio. So if you have an Amazon Echo or Google Home, you have no excuse. Ask it to play the latest episode of the Discography Discussion podcast, and it will. We're also on Facebook and on Twitter at Discuss Metal. Be sure to like, favorite, and subscribe. It really helps us out. It lets us know you're listening. And now Dan is going to tell us all about five-star reviews. Five-star reviews. Let's see. They have five stars in them, uh, so there's that. Um, leave us a review on Apple Podcasts if you should feel so inclined. Keep on sharing the episodes like you guys have been sharing them. And uh, we appreciate everything that you guys do every week. Speaking of what the listener does, do you want to read some feedback for us, Dan? 
Oh yeah, man. I got a I got a hot one uh, coming in off of uh, Facebook. Coming in hot. <laughs> this is uh, from Christopher Powell in response to uh, our Testament episode. He says, "I'm not into Titans of Creation at all, except for Night of the Witch. I cannot remember a single riff or hook on it." Sepultura Quadra pisses all over this album. Give that an honest listen. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, maybe. I don't know. I haven't listened to that album since we did the Sepultura episode. Uh, he goes on to say, I actually went back and listened to the Green Era of Sepultura after that episode, and to my surprise, loved it a lot. Their last four albums, uh, Kairos to Quadra, are sick albums. Uh, love the Max Era too, but I dig how the band evolved their sound and became more technical. Great podcast. Well, that is a great comment with lots of little juicy tidbits. I feel like we may have to do a Sepultura episode at some point. You mean a revisited Sepultura episode, right? Yes. I'm not sure anyone can convince you that any album, no matter how great, is better than an album that has an opening track about the Heaven's Gate cult. <laughs> oh, I mean, I'm a I'm a Testament fanboy, so you know, I'm gonna like I'm gonna like pretty much all of their albums. I can't think of one that I even was like, this one's bad. Maybe it was Souls of the Souls of Black. I think that was the only one that I was like, I'm not really stoked on that. I tried. I did a thing. It was your no thank you bite. Over on uh, over on Twitter, we got a message or a tweet rather. We don't get messages on Twitter. We get tweets, right? So that, that's how it works. You can so get a little, messages. A little birdie on Twitter told us uh, th- uh, in response to episode 211, Earth Crisis. This is a big deal. Most influential North American hardcore band for the South Brent hard- hardcore scene, in my opinion. Um, yeah, I mean, these, these guys were massively influential. Uh, it was a lot of fun to talk about Earth Crisis and to listen to those last few albums. Those things were scorchers, man. Um, Jetta PA says, OMG, Candiria, obviously in response to our Candiria episode, 300% density absolutely slays. I agree. 100%. <laughs> uh, and I love that. I love this name. Uh, Human Falafel says, Candiria and Starkweather, two of the most influential experimental metalcore you didn't know exist. Well, here's the thing. I do know that Candiria exists. I know that Starkweather exists too, but I we didn't talk about them. We should have. Do I need to put that on the list? Do it. Do it. Make it so. Hey, John, what's going on on Brutally Speaking this week? You know, we're talking about stuff and things and bands and people being brutal. Brutal. John is not giving me anything to work with tonight. <laughs> <laughs> so, Dan... Tell me about Maylene and the Sons of Disaster. Hey, what about me? Brutally speaking. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I kid. I kid. All right. Maylene and the... I'm going to have so much trouble saying this band's name, so I'm just going to call them Maylene for most of the episode. Put you into a car accident or something? Well, shut up. (laughs) I'll kill you. It doesn't kill you. Maylene and the Sons of Disaster is an American band. They are from Birmingham, Alabama. They are coming to your town. They pretty much started right after Dallas got kicked out of Under Oath. Uh, so I know most professional places say, like, you know, his departure, which it was a departure, but it was not by choice. Dude was kicked out of the band. So that, that's where it is. And he said, you know what? I don't want to play whatever Under Oath's playing. I want to go real, real, real south. And uh, you end up with Maylene, which is a... I guess you would call them at their base like a groove metal band, but they're still like guys that play metalcore. So you get this like weird combination of like groove metal, very southern sounding riffs. If you don't know what I mean by southern sounding riffs, go listen to Pantera. Um, or Skinner. Or Skinner, you know. But I think there's more Pantera in here than there is Skinner. Mm, maybe, maybe. We'll there's get, a little we'll bit there. of Skinner. There's definitely some Skinner influence in here. Le- as we go, there's more of it, I yep. hear. But, uh, yeah, Maylene was kind of one of those bands that, like I said in the intro, they were doing something truly unique, but so many other bands started doing it that it stopped being, it, it stopped seeming unique after a while. 2005, Maylene and the Sons of Disaster. Hey, I wonder what the next three albums are called. <laughs> it's what you name your children if you're a Southern. It's what I should have done. Can you imagine listening to that under taxes and dependence? Let's see, this here's one. This, this is Daniel Terry 1. This is this Daniel Terry 2. 2. <laughs> this is Daniel Terry 3. Yeah. Hey, Hank Williams did it. Yeah, that's true. No, so it's a dude. great result, actually. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so this record was obviously the first mailing thing that I ever heard. Uh, be weird if I, you know, if, if I heard another album in 2005 by them. But uh, I can say this. 
I'm not really into this too much. Um, I realize why people like it, and I love metalcore, uh, but I'm not I'm not as big on southern music. Uh, it really really as a whole, and I know that's like kind kind of mean, but it's just how I feel. I'm not saying it's bad. It's just not for me. But one of the things that that I think makes this sound a little gimmicky to me is that Dallas is doing a southern voice. Like he's screaming. And I have to admit his screaming's better than it was in Under Oath. But it's it's so like mom and pop, let's go eat some chicken wings. Like it's just very um it's on the nose, I guess. If if there's any other way to describe it, just when a guy's doing a voice, it can be hard for me to connect to it. And I feel like this is a little bit disjointed. For context, Dan is really not a fan of blues-based rock and blues-based metal. So if you've got bendy notes in the guitar, he's not a fan. He takes some convincing. Like Black Sabbath. Black Sabbath is amazing, but they're a heavy rock band, right? And bl- very blues-influenced. So why do you hate this? Because Black Sabbath doesn't sound like this. Black Sabbath is all about the gloom and the doom. This is like, uh, let me drive my, let me, let me, let me grab my like Ford Escort and put gigantic monster truck wheels on it and drive it down my hometown's main street while blasting Maylene and the Sons of Disaster. In this scenario, <laughs> have you upgraded <laughs> the sound in the car? <laughs> oh, all eight tracks. Oh, it's completely eight tracks. Oh, I so got, you've downgraded I got this, in this scenario. I got this and some Hank Williams and some Johnny Cash. I got my spit cup in the in the console too. <laughs> well, I actually, I actually do have that, uh, but you know, this I is definitely spit cup. <laughs> this is one of the own Bane's back on the podcast. Uh, I, I do love think the South. <laughs> I do think that uh, I think this has a cool factor. And Buddy and I, when we did our radio show, used to play uh, Tough as John Jacobs all the time. Like that was that was our lead kind of. Like, oh, yeah, man, let's put on some Maylene. And we give each other that look like, yeah, man, this is where it's at. And and this is a record that I really, really want to like because all my friends like it. A lot of the people listening to this like it. Uh, but I just found it really, really hard for me to, to connect with it in an emotional way. Uh, and, you know, John kind of brought this to my attention earlier this week, too, that it's because they're also telling a story. Throughout the whole discography, yeah, they're telling they're telling a gigantic story uh, about Ma Barker, the criminal mastermind, and her sons, um, and it's just kind of like a like a cautionary tale, I guess, so to speak. And um, you could really hear that on the last track. Just wanted to make Mother proud, um, which is actually ironically one of the more interesting songs on the on the album uh, because it's got a little bit more melody, a little bit more subtlety. Whereas everything else just sounds, it sounds like they're having a great time and I'll give them that. Um, but like, just for me, I couldn't enjoy this one as much. It just, it sounded like they kept doing the same thing nine times. And I know the songs are different. They've got different riffs. They're different, you know, they're different songs, but, but for whatever reason, the overall impression was not a super positive one with me. And I don't think it's bad. I think if you like this kind of music, you'll be into it. But I just, I, I either want it to be metalcore or I want it to be like just straight Southern rock. And, uh, and they figure this out over time. I like listening to this record for the combination of styles that are very strange in 2005. Metalcore is taking over. It either sounds like Under Oath, it sounds like Kill Switch Engage. We've had this conversation before. Here you have Maylene and the Sons of Disaster, who is basically doing George Thorogood with a hardcore band. It's not the greatest description in the world, but this is what would come out of that scenario, I think. So it's more fun to me listening to this because I like riffs more so than let's try to create complex chaos. And that's what I think a lot of those early hardcore bands were doing. It works when it works, but when it doesn't work, it just sounds like noise. So this sounds like the exact opposite of that. Let's be more intense, but still have the riffs. And I cannot stress how far opposite of the trends in 2005 this record was. Because new Metal was dying. Metalcore was on the way in. Nobody on the radio was playing something this heavy with this type of vocals with this style of guitar playing. Um, I, I don't know. This, this feels like the era it's from. Uh, a lot of 
<laughs> pull offs uh, in your guitar playing that just kind of signified that, like, you know, we're sort of a southern band of some sort. Um, I wasn't really too stoked on this record either. Uh, I felt like this is just trying way too hard uh, to be a southern southern metal thing instead of just writing whatever comes more natural or I should say comes more natural in presentation. Um, you know, as Dan kind of said, I had kind of pointed out through some digging just to kind of see because actually, you know, I just just wanted to make Mama Proud is a really great example. I really liked that song and I think it's a way more interesting song than anything else they had done on the album. And it, you know, I kind of started following more of the lyrics because you can kind of Dallas wasn't trying so hard on that song. It, it felt more organic. And so I really was trying to take in the lyrics. You know, I just kind of got this vibe of like, you know, it's like an origin story or the ending to an origin story. And, you know, basically, spoiler alert, everyone dies. Um, and it was one of those things where I started kind of digging into the lyrics and what were what were influencing these. And then that's when I had come across the fact that um, there was this underlying story, this narrative of basically the Ma Barker and her sons and the crime organization and basically writing from the perspective of, you know, that and. I feel like I wonder at least at times, and I'm probably going to hit on this a couple more times throughout the discography, that I wonder if trying to write from that perspective actually severely limited the band and what they could do, because that was the singular narrative that you were trying to write from always. Um, I do wish, you know, songs like Gusty Like the Wind, I, I wish there was a little bit more melody like the chorus in that song like there's there's pieces and they're there and you're like you're you're almost kind of there but you're just not it, all the pieces haven't fallen into place and what you kind of get is just basically a mediocre album at best uh but that there is hope that it'll get better so you think the theme or the story limited the overall creativity on this one I feel like for me, once I learned that and then kind of went back through and listened to all the, the four albums, I feel like at times there's always a song or two that really shine through on every album. And like I said, the last usually the album closers are really kind of epic and, and do really good jobs of kind of uh, capping the story of, I guess, that that's being told on these albums. But I, I kind of wondered if perhaps it's just a thing where maybe it's hard when you're establishing right away that you're kind of doing a concept record and you always are going to do a concept record, but you're not necessarily telling anyone that you're doing a concept record and that they have to somehow know this. And I mean, back in what, 2004, 2005, the Internet wasn't really what it is now. So for you to not even understand that from the name even, you're referencing something that is going to be the entity of what your whole band is. I think it's a little bit hard to keep hammering down in like time in and time, time and time again. And then on top of that, you know, I really have been thinking about how does how do you present that in a live setting? Because if you're telling a whole story in a record and you only have a 25 minute set opening for someone, how do you get that narrative across? How do you pick something where maybe it's not it's not able to be come across as well because you're not able to set it up with the other narratives that you're running throughout the story you're telling on this on this set of records or whatever yeah and i think in a case like that well you pick your four favorite four or five favorite songs to play and you just abandon the concept altogether and see to uh, me that's where that gets weird because then it's like well then why do that in the first place if you're going to have to abandon it so quickly out the gate I don't know. I mean, I, I I'm gonna I'm gonna go to bat for them have, wanting to have the artistic freedom, you know, to do what they want to do, whether it's practical or it's not. I haven't encountered a lot of of situations where an album is a concept album, or in this case, even a concept band. Right. Um. You know, I haven't seen that not be problematic, except for in a few very very uh, isolated cases. Um. So you know, whenever whenever we move on in the discography. Um, things things start getting a little interesting here. 2007, two, the second Maylene and the Sons of Disaster record. <laughs> this is this is uh, this is like the first album um, in concept, at least as far as overall sound goes. I think you could describe it as the same genre, um, but the songwriting has stepped up considerably on this record. The songs have much better flow to them. They play like actual songs, and they're heavy. They're legitimately heavy. Dallas's vocals, I'm still not 100% on board with uh, on this one, but I enjoy them 
you know, I mean, it's hard not to bang your head to a song like Darkest of Kin. You know, that one starts off pretty, pretty rough, pretty hard. Um, Dry the River, uh, probably their biggest song off of this record, um, has a very nice, catchy chorus, a good hook to it. Um, and I think that, that that this record is really what I feel elevated the band to a higher level um, because these songs are much more memorable. It, it's it's a redo. It's it's the first album, but it's better. And it has more of a raw hardcore sound. It's like they leaned into the production style of those hardcore records, but still played the Southern rock influenced riffs. It's almost showbread dry in places. And I appreciate that because that keeps me in the zone of what this album sounds like. Well, yeah, they dried the river, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think we, I think we've, we've, you know, we, we, we've said that like, yeah, it's raw. It's, 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 it's a, uh, it's a little dry. But I think it works, and and just like the first album, they ended off with the day the hell the day hell broke loose at Sickard Hollow, which again like picks up on this concept that you had, but just wanted to make Mother proud. Um, and again, they're they're doing this really well. <laughs> um, and I and I think this record overall, I could listen to this one you know a couple times in a row and really really enjoy it. Whereas I feel the first record was just a little too much. Yeah, I, uh, by the way, I think I thought of another band, too, that did this, the album titles just being numeric, and I think it was Down. You had Down 1, oh, Down yeah. 2, uh, Bustle in Your Hedgerow, Down 3, something or other. I don't remember what that was called, but I think Down did that as well. Um, just, you know, for anyone who maybe was in that on that conversation, and I know like I do like to do when I'm listening to podcasts, I'm like, oh, you motherfuckers, you missed this one. Um, but that being said, right away, this sounds better. Two sounds better than the previous album. Dallas's voice seems to have kind of found its place amongst the music itself. Um, I still think at times this band is trying a little too hard to push the Southern sound. Um, I can definitely hear more of the band's influences on this one. Like Death is an Alcoholic uh, has a bit of that Thin Lizzy swagger uh, with that opening lead riff and the giant chorus to pay off the fucking dirty, nasty sleaze of that riff. Um, Tale of the Runaways and the Day Hell Broke Loose uh, at Sickert Hollow, again, might be my favorites off this album, sort of echoing Dan's sentiments. Uh, to me, if you're going to go all Southern, do it like this with the acoustic guitar, with the slide guitar thrown in, with even some of those banjos and so forth. Like, I just feel like this wasn't really a thing in the early 2000s, early 2000s, and is more interesting and in, is what separates them from the bands like the He Is Legends and the Every Time I Die is that we're kind of doing this. And even some of the bands like, you know, the showdown kind of coming at the heels of this sound at this point, you know, it, it's separating them from all of them. Um, I feel like... This album, I feel like I like this album more than the first. But again, when this is done, I'm left wondering, you know, where will this go? And will this be the one where I go, ah, they perfected the balance I'm looking for from this band? Yeah. At this point in the discography, they're very compartmentalized for me. Yeah. I put them in the same boat mentally as Showbread at that time, because that was the exact opposite of what everybody else was doing. So to hear a band playing this style and merging it with hardcore, it works in a way that is just more entertaining to me than the copycat after copycat after copycat that was saturating everything at the time. This was something different, not necessarily something new, but it was something that had been done before. We just all needed to be reminded that it was still fucking cool. I wonder if it was new by 2007 because I and I may have my I may have my my years or my dates a little a little a little mi mixed up, you know, but I do think that everybody after Bailey put out that first record, I think everybody jumped on that bandwagon. I don't know if by 07 everybody was still on it except for Maylene. And I think that that is one of the most important things is after Maylene shows up, everybody thinks they can play Southern metal or Southern rock or Southern hardcore, whatever that means. Um, and it's interesting to hear stuff like this going further into the discography. And what I think is interesting, too, is how even though as we go on, they're going to change their sound significantly, they still keep the concept in check and they still stick with the Southern rock theme, although more emphasis on the rock this time around. 2009. Three. Two, one. Oh wait. <laughs> Sorry, I thought I thought we were doing a thing. Yeah, dude, we're talking about Hank the Third and Ass Jack because you have to talk about them at the same time. Nobody. Well, that's just a shock. 
<laughs> so I'm more interested to hear what John thought of three. So for me, right out the gate, this is getting a little bit more southern swampy vibes on it. Waiting on my deathbed, you know, great example of that. Um, seems that on track one, we found a way to blend what I like about the more slower elements of the band and their penchant for writing riff heavy rockers. To me, this is the quintessential Maylene album so far, uh, as they figured out a way to do the southern thing without it feeling forced, blending rock riffs with the slide guitars, banjos and all of that. And this is probably the best that Dallas has sounded to me. Um, I like that this album feels like dudes getting in a room and jamming versus writing parts. Choruses are better and stronger. And I also love the diversity of the guitar tones that seemingly help give the vibe of something working for each song. Some have that straight ahead 80s sound like on Old Iron Hills to even some of that great white poison. Let me rephrase that to the great white slash poison style twang in Listen Close, complete with the like a total 80s, like Def Leppardy inspired monster chorus with like layered and layered and layered vocals like Mutt Lang loved to do. Fuck yeah. Um, I also really want to see this band do an acoustic album after hearing this. Where Saints Roam and The End Is Here and The End Is Beautiful and most of the other album closers would make for a great unplugged set uh, or hell with the band writing from perspective of a crime family. Um, do a storyteller's vibe and just tell like set it up to make it look like a campfire and that you're sitting around and you're kind of telling these like, you know, not ghost stories, but basically you're telling like these outlaw country kind of songs in an acoustic style. And I think that would really lend the band to a really interesting album that hasn't been done and would allow them to kind of narrate almost like a Broadway esque kind of performance. Um, something I think one of the few bands that could probably pull something like that off. But this felt very ambitious and felt very uh, balanced finally like you know I was kind of hinting at like when is the band going to be able to put all the pieces together and write a cohesive record that sounds great from start to finish and to me this is it I like the 80s vibe that you mentioned it definitely sounds like an older hard rock heavy metal band playing southern rock it gives off that vibe like we used to be time aligned for shit and vocals were stacked you know, Rat put out Infestation in 2010, and guess what? It still sounded like Rat, but it came out in 2010. So take that vibe of that big chorus, and you've got insert name of 80s record. And you have that in 2009, almost fully realized, except it's Mailing in the Sons of Disaster. We're still going to hit you with that hardcore a little bit on this one. So if you take the hardcore screams out, I can show this to my dad. Yep. You know, and he'll be all like, hell yeah. Let's go. No, that's camping. a different band. That's a different Southern yeah, band. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, Drinking beer, smoking weed. I think that, you know, he'd be like, yeah, let's go camping. You know, let's go shoot the guns. You know, all, all the good stuff that we do down here in Missouri. Uh, but I, I will say that this is probably my favorite of the four. Uh, just because the songwriting, like John said, is at its, at its finest. Um, they are much more cohesive than they were before. The, this is all about the songs now. It's not about the sound, the vibe. There's definitely a good sound and a good vibe, but it's not about that. They wrote these songs and put them together uh, in, a, in a really in a really cohesive way that showed an understanding of what good songwriting is that I think a lot of bands that start off in the hardcore scene don't really have. Uh, the, these guys wanted to write strong, hooky songs, and I think they've wanted to do that since the beginning, but I think this is where it really is the apex of it. And, you know, I guess, guys, if there's any other way to describe it, I would say that this is the Citizen Kane of... No. <laughs> Rosebud. We've already made that film reference. I mean, actually, it's interesting, though. Like, you know, I know unbeknownst to Dan, that probably wasn't the theme of uh, these two discographies. But, you know, we always talk about how we record these kind of in twos or in pairs. And it's interesting when you kind of start finding the underlying similarities between the discographies we're checking out with... And now with Maylene, you know, we kind of said that the third album was kind of both bands really figuring out who they were, writing their most ambitious and consistently great work that we we're like, yes, finally, like you had the pieces and now you put it all together, whether that's, you know, just being unafraid to write the records that you wanted to, you're not having a label necessarily pressuring you, maybe spending more time writing these records or just spending time with each other as musicians you know, whatever the case may be, the third record between these two discographies is just basically the landmark record for both these bands where we're like, this is why you listen to this band and this is why you would 
you know, why the hype basically behind these bands is what it is, is probably because of these records. Yeah, I mean, I can just agree. I think that, you know, both if you're looking at both bands kind of comparatively, it also was a third album that, you know, the bands had both spent a lot of time establishing their sound, locking in their fan base. And I think that that third record idea is just like, okay, how do we branch out of that? Yeah. Without alienating our fans. And I think this record especially does a really good job of keeping people that were fans of the old Maylene on board mm -hmm. uh, and giving them enough of that Maylene sound that they enjoyed before, uh, but also going on and making everything much, uh, much more cohesive. Um, they're not going to necessarily do that on the next record. Can I go first on that one, please? <laughs> sure, John. Okay. Joe, you put that Godsmack record down. I swear to God, smack. But Dan, it's 2011 and we're talking about four. Ooh. Three, this, two, one, go, John. This is not good. Like, this sounds like a clear attempt to cash in on going more mainstream. I don't know what really to say about this. The first song sounds like we listened to a bunch of clutch and threw in a dash of STP's odd chorus structures thrown in for good measure. Um, overall, this just feels like a band who had been working towards their own sound. And then when this comes out of left field, it's like, wow, this is really a shame that this is the last album we're going to have from the band and not the one before it. Um, there's really, to me, not much redeeming quality uh, on this record. Sorry. It sounds like a simpler... It's not Simple Man. Don't say it. ...record than John. <laughs> With most of these bands that put out the seminal record, the one that you have to listen to, how often are we talking about the follow-up being a simplified version of that because this when you've even gone a through version, man. <laughs> all of that and spent that much time putting in all those extra layers and pieces and making it sound like the big overall production that it was whether that's the producer of the band i don't know how many times are we talking about the next album we just wanted to play music we didn't want to have to put work into it we wanted to have fun again and it ends up sounding like this which is unfortunately not as good as the previous three records in my opinion well i hate to be the guy that says this but uh i like this record <laughs> <laughs> uh i like it because i uh, you know as we talked about i wasn't super thrilled with maylene kind of in the beginning which is i know blasphemy for a lot of people uh but i i don't know i kind of really enjoyed hearing this um and i think a lot of it comes down to i don't listen to that much mainstream rock so if I'm going to listen to a mainstream rock record, I'm going to hear it from a band like this. Or like, you know, those weird couple years where Cave-In went mainstream rock. You know, uh, I I don't know. I kind of like the 80s vibe of this record. Um, I like it because it's not quite as swampy uh, as the as the other stuff. Uh, it's not as it's not as uh, Kentucky Fried Hardcore, uh, as I used to call it. And I think it's just, uh, I, think it, I think it's smooth. I enjoy it. I don't think it's the best Malian record. I think it's hardly a Maylene record, uh, if I'm being honest. Um, but I also still kind of enjoyed it. Um, you know, it's not my go-to of all time, but I, I don't know. Uh, I found it somewhat pleasant to listen to uh, after after listening to the other three. Uh, now, what do I think the fans thought of it? I'm thinking probably not great. Probably not great reviews. If you're a guy that likes, you know, screaming and your groovy riffs, you're, you're not going to like this. This is, this is not going to do it for you. But, uh, you know, the drought of 85, I, I, I like it. I don't care what anybody says. <laughs> you can come fight me. And then, sadly, uh, this would be the last Maylene record, at least for the time being, as uh, a, which is well publicized. I'm not going to get into it too much. But, uh, unfortunately, lead singer uh, Dallas Taylor was uh, in a horrible ATV accident, uh, and he has been recovering from it for years. Um, like, there, there were times where they weren't even sure if he was going to make it, you know. Uh, but he's uh, he's still hanging on. I mean, uh, yeah, because I think this ATV accident, yeah, it was in January of 2015. So for six years, this dude's still not back to 100%. Um, but you know what? I, you know, whether whether I liked this band, you know, totally or, or not uh, is irrelevant. I, I would love to see them give it another shot someday. Overall, the band delivers that Southern rock sound mixed with hardcore. So, hell yes, bring on Maylene 5. I'd listen to it. Then there was that time when Skyler from uh, He Is Legend did vocals for uh, Maylene. I would have liked to see that. 
because I was a really big fan of Skylar's vocals in, uh, well, all of He Is Legend uh, <laughs> as well, but but more specifically in reference to Maylene, the uh, his, his vocals on uh, Suck Out the Poison. I have a feeling we probably got a very similar experience there. Final thoughts on Maylene and the Sons of Disaster. John. Um, I think for me, it's it's this discography is kind of frustrating because you can see the potential where the band is going to go and that they can be great, but largely they miss the mark. And then when they finally do hit it, they're not consistent enough with the delivery because then they put out four, which is completely not the same as three. Sounds weird to say it like that. Uh, who does number two work for? Um, that's right. You give that turd hell. Um, but it's one of those things where I just walk away from this discography going, you know, they got compared to so many other great bands. Every time I die, they got compared to. Uh, well, I mean, he did really, but <laughs> uh, he is legend. But I mean, he is legend also changed every time I die has changed. And I feel like. It seemed like this band was kind of one of the first to really take that adventurous leap forward where the other two bands hadn't yet. And they just never stayed the course, uh, seemingly. I uh, don't know if that's due to lineup changes, you know, listening to labels or whatever. If, you know, maybe the third record actually didn't do very well. Um, and that's why they didn't make that record kind of sound again. Um, this is kind of largely a frustrating discography for me i would be interested to see especially in light of uh what dallas has gone through if potentially a, a new record would actually drop the narrative of basically what they're writing or have been writing about and it would be more more about dallas and his experiences or if he would somehow be able to parlay this into life of a you know outlaw on the run you know down and out and if he would be able to really sell those themes more because he has the conviction to go from and draw from now, uh, whereas he wouldn't before. So I, I'm definitely not down and out about this band. If they were to put out something, I definitely would check it out and see what's going on and hopes that it would sound more like four. But um, definitely some fun stuff throughout the discography worth checking out at least once. Damn, what about you? I think that Maylene is very influential and they, they very much define a specific period of metalcore that was going on uh, in the mid to late 2000s and I like that they stuck with it I didn't always like what they did but um, they were a band that I thought was outrageously solid for what they were doing um, I just couldn't get past that hurdle of it being super southern music which I'm not typically a huge fan of and um, that's not their fault but uh, you know I definitely still saw the uh, I was still able to appreciate the integrity of songwriting, especially in those middle two records. I think Maylene and the Sons of Disaster hit a sweet spot that otherwise did not exist in 2005. And for better or for worse, they maintained the intentions throughout their current discography. I look at a band like Zeal and Ardor, and I think that's something that started as a joke. Like, wouldn't it be funny if you put these two styles together? And then somebody did it. I wonder if this started the same way. Somebody said, why not mix these two styles together? And then somebody did it. So when you look back on Maylene and the Sons of Disaster, yes, they influenced a lot of bands. And I would go as far to say, we wouldn't have what is currently referred to as dark country without Maylene and the Sons of Disaster. So listen to Maylene and the Sons of Disaster because they have influenced more of your favorite music than you're probably aware of and if you're not into the overall southern rock sound give it a shot anyway because there's some hardcore in there that's gonna keep you guessing if they're gonna do that voice again on the next song damn what's your album of the week my album of the week well it's not really an album but i've been listening to the new the two new nf singles uh lost and uh Lost in Clouds, Lost featuring Hobson, which is one of the best songs I've heard this year. He literally, it's NF walking up a mountain and he finds Hobson buried in the snow and pulls him out and he starts rapping. It's awesome. John, what about you? So I was watching uh, Key from Every Time I Die is, speaking of Southern Hardcore, uh, by way of the East Coast. <laughs> um, but watching Keith from uh, Every Time I Die's uh, Twitch stream last night as when we're recording, 
and he had uh, his friend Chauncey on, and they had Sonny that runs Hate Five Six. That like, if you ever see the, like those This Is Hardcore sets, um, they were just running through classic This Is Hardcore sets and sets that Sonny has filmed, including some old Earth Crisis, uh, which is really cool. And they played a band, and I've never heard of them, and I'm ashamed that I never have. But I'm making sure you all don't live in my mistakes. It's this band Sand. They're from Japan, and the album is Spit on Authority. Go look up the song Poser, and if that doesn't make you want to fucking beat someone down, I don't know what will. It's basically East Coast Hardcore by way of, like, Japan. 90s East Coast Hardcore. Just beat down riffs. It's fucking great. And they're singing in basically broken English. Um, but yeah, go check out the video for Poser. Even better. Yeah, go check out for the, the video for Poser. Um, it's fucking great. And then go look up the Hate uh, Hate Five Six sets. There's two of them that I've seen. One uh, recorded in Tokyo from at this point two years ago, and then the one from I think 2015 or 16 from This Is Hardcore. That band just fucking rips. Um, yeah, uh, do yourself a just do yourself a favor and go fucking listen to that band. Holy shit. Dan, I see an incoming Patreon episode. What about you? I mean, it could happen. <laughs> Put it on the list. I mean, I sent Dan the the link to the video last night. He did not seem to even give a shit. <laughs> I did not. Dude, I felt like garbage last night. Literally, I think I think somebody found me in an alleyway, you know, unconscious. So <laughs> I'm not sure what you guys do on the weekends, but. Well, I'm bringing it back for one more album of the week. The legendary Shack Shakers, Pandelirium. They're from here. Watch out for the monkey in the doghouse, John. Take us out, DFT. If you like this podcast and you listen every week and you want to have a little bit more to say in what goes on in the podcast, we are always up for suggestions. You can send your suggestions right to Dan and Joe Show at gmail.com. You can message us or comment on our posts on Facebook at facebook.com slash discography discussion. You can like our sweet, sweet album cover pictures that I post on Instagram every now and again at Discuss Metal, or you can message us there. You can tweet at us at Discuss Metal or at myself personally at Discuss Metal Dan. Uh, and uh, you can also find us on YouTube under Discuss Metal Dan. And uh, I'll have some pretty sweet videos coming up uh, very soon. I also do a lot of like gaming live streams, interviews, and stuff like that. Even some brutally speaking stuff ends up on the on the YouTube channel. So uh, make sure you guys are checking that out. You can always reach out to us and chat with us on Discord. There's going to be a link in the show notes that'll take you to our Discord server. And uh, if you want to get some sweet discography discussion merch, there's also a link that'll take you to our Teespring store that has a variety of different items with our logo all over them that you can check out and enjoy and show all your friends. And on that note, this has been episode 214 of Discography Discussion. Thank you for listening. You can like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at Discuss Metal. Subscribe to our podcast everywhere you listen to podcasts, including Google Play, Apple Podcasts, and Stitcher. Visit DiscussMetal.com for all things discography discussion. And please send questions and comments to Dan and Joe Show at gmail.com. If you are not a patron, you can become one at patreon.com forward slash Discuss Metal. We have some sweet perks. I get some money. $1 a month gets you into that exclusive album review feed. 